Shadows of Brainstone Forbidden Fortress. This is the, the third core set for Shadow of Brainstone after City of the Ancients and Swamps of Death and also after a plethora of expansions that have enlarged the story world of Shadows of Brainstone in the last couple of, of years. This is a game that has a world building that is worth of the great sagas of, say, of Tolkien or Song of Ice and Fire. It's a very large story world with a lot of characters, a lot of stuff going on. It definitely has an epic feel. When you have one or both of the sets and you start adding expansions, you really get the sense that you're exploring different places, it's a world that you really get to know in which you also get to develop your characters game after game. It is among all the board games that came out, let's say in the last decade, one of those that the most has the strong feel of a role-playing game. It has that narrative power. In fact, I believe when I originally reviewed uh, the game, I described it as a narrative engine, and I'm still of that opinion. It is one of the best narrative engines in the form of a board game that we have had in a long time. It is Warhammer Quest for the 21st century. Now, in the uh, previous installments of the family of the world of Shadows of Brimstone, we had this nice intersection, or very original intersection between Lovecraftian themes and all Western lore. And so you have cowboys and all of those characters from Western movies that all of a sudden were dealing with tentacles that were bursting out of the ground with gates to other dimensions, with corruption that was floating in the air, turning, uh, leading people to madness and so on and so forth. Very original, very original take on Lovecraftian ideas. With Forbidden Fortress, we have a new hybrid between Lovecraft, uh, Lovecraftian themes and something that usually is not associated with Lovecraft, which is classic Japan. Now, I don't know that it's classic Japan the way it was. I don't think that I learned a lot about, about old Japan by playing this game. But it is the kind of Japan that I imagine from, uh, from fantasy, that I imagine from samurai movies. Pretty much like you don't necessarily learn much about the antebellum America or the American Civil War from playing Shadows of Brimstone, um, uh, City of the Ancients, for example. So it is Japanese-inspired fantasy with Lovecraftian themes. It's a new core set, so everything that you need to play the game, all the rules, all the components is in here. You could choose to start from here if you miss the train and you didn't get any of the previous sets. Or you can use this to yet expand yet again the world of Shadows of Brainstone because everything that you find here is compatible with what we had before. After all, if the universe is a busted book, it is a place full of like holes and, and tears and rips and places where you can enter one door and you fall into another world, all of the worlds are part of this incredibly messy labyrinth thing. Chaos. Well, why couldn't you have... Well, first, why don't you continue to have Lovecraftian things happening somewhere else in the world? Why does it only have to be American? Why do we have to get the exclusive of Lovecraftian things? Maybe those things are also happening in Japan. Maybe in the future we can have Shadows of Brainstorm in other areas of the world. And how about time? Again, time is just a function of our inability to understand eternity and to understand the deeper truth that as a thought spends all of his time um, dreaming about. And so does Cthulhu. There's a lot of dreaming going on in Lovecraftian things. So even thematically it makes perfect sense that you have a samurai that steps into a gate and finds himself in the Old West or you have uh, a marshal that ends up in ancient Japan and 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 teams up with the Japanese sorcerers to defeat some ancient some ancient monstrosity. Very fascinating. So you have a different theme and you have um, a similar genre with a different implementation of the old ideas. Gameplay is exactly the same. So if you love the old gameplay, you should be pleased here. And really, that's fine, because gameplay is already solid in the original 
shadows of brainstorm the power of the system has been precisely that they had a solid system to start with and that's why they didn't have to constantly retweak it retweak it or correct it or fix it they could just work on the world building which they've done amazingly so now without further ado let me show you what you find in the box of shadows of brainstorm forbidden fortress get your sense of the gameplay possibility that emerge from the components in this box and then at the end i'll share some conclusions with you that you probably can already tell are gonna be pretty enthusiastic sorry for the spoiler let's talk about the game now miniatures have always been a big attractive in all sets of shadows of brimstone so let's start by taking a closer look at the miniatures that you find in forbidden fortress a caveat i'm not a painter or builder of miniatures so maybe they will not look in all their glory definitely the miniatures as i assemble them and i left it unpainted will not look nearly as good as they will after you assemble them but at least you get a sense here in the front we have the four heroes the four heroes of this adventure which are the sorceress you can see she's here casting spells the monk you don't see his face because he's so pensive and it has this magic bell that protects his himself and his paws the samurai just a pretty tough dude and then the assassin the assassin uh, as for the monsters you need those for the adventure to be exciting we have the dishonored dead which is this samurai zombies and well unfortunately they do look like the regular samurai find the samurai in there um is this one but still it usually is not that easy and that is why this set will not only look better but play better if you can paint it but i can't paint so what can i do here we have the acidic tentacles, it ain't Shadows of Brimstone or Lovecraft inspired the horror if you don't have some tentacles. Then we have some Japanese inspired enemies, we have the Tengus which are these flying swordmen or sword uh, whatever they are. And they're, they don't deal a lot of damage but they do fight pretty well, they can parry your hits. And we go to the big one, we have the Onis, the big demons of Japanese lore. Then we have the Haryonago, this phantom, the spectre that flies on her own hair and creates a cloud of very dangerous hair around her. And she's able to attack enemies with her hair to ensnare enemies. By the way, enemies means you, just in case you're missing that. And then we have the centerpiece of the set, miniature-wise, which is this gigantic miniature here, who represents, which represents a living statue pretty terrifying right now as for the characters not just how the miniatures look but how the characters actually play we have the monk here you have his card oh by the way while the miniatures are gendered you only have one per gender the card the list is double-sided with two different versions a male a female version of each hero what we have here is the usual stats. Uh, the monk uses chi, will use these tokens, will generate some each turn and then can spend them to heal people or to make his hits more nasty. For every two chi tokens spent, you increase the damage by one for that hit for each chi token you can heal a single target. He's fairly good in melee, not as much in range attack and is a very strong willpower. Also, each character comes with a set of cards that will allow you to customize your hero uh, further. For example, you can have different types of monk with different with different abilities. You will choose one of these cards at the beginning. You have the bell that will protect you and all of your friends once per adventure, and the staff that. If equipped as a double, as a two-hand weapon, allows you to roll a d8 for damage instead of a d6. He knows how to hit some pressure points with that, no doubt. Then we have the, uh, this is upside down, the Samurai Warrior. The Samurai Warrior, here is his... His character sheet, the camera warrior, will use fury tokens to 
uh, be able to uh, to use uh, to use static cards that will give me special moves. Very interesting because that means that the heavy hitter does not just hit 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 always the same, but can use different abilities. Makes it more interesting. Different types of samurai that you will uh, you will select. Starting gear. Very good, so heavily armed and heavily protected. And then here we have, as you can see, a very healthy number of different tactics that can be equipped to the samurai. We're not gonna read them all, but just to give you a sense of how much variety there is, even when you play the samurai, the standard warrior that is not always the most fun character in, in many games. The sorceress, the sorceress, uh, has elemental magic, so at the beginning you choose a school of magic or one of the four elements and she will be more likely to be able to cast spells in that uh, in that school of magic. At the beginning that's all that you have, but as she levels up she can take, so she can also take spells from other schools, but she's not as apt at um, casting them. She will gain mana tokens so that then she spends to cast spells. She has a standard spell, which is a sort of uh, standard range attacks. Oh, by the way, again, different types of sort of like basic, basic setup for your for your sorcerers, plus the standard free uh, starting upgrade, which is this generic elemental blast. Whatever the element you choose, you will be able to use this blast as a ranged weapon. Starting gear, she will place tokens on this bag that will help her cast spells. By spending those tokens, she will make it more likely to be able to cast spells effectively. Look at what a nice range of spells or spells that she has. As you can see they're divided in different schools based on the on the element and when she wants to use a spell she will have to spend the mana cost simply in terms of mana tokens that she discards for the time being and then she rolls two dice and you need to roll that or higher. You can apply modifiers including uh, including the demon powder, the cane powder that she stores in this bag. If she rolls the number of higher after modifiers have been taken into account that she can use these spells which are pretty tough. Some are for attacking, some are for defense, some are so powerful that there's a chance she'll get corrupted. Um, I personally really like the water spell. There's one that I like very much. Tsunami is pretty nice. And the water burst is a defensive spell. Probably one of my favorite spells is nothing else with thematic purposes. Basically when you take a hit, you use it, you gain cover too because you're turning into water. Slash, they're slashing to you and you fall to the ground as a big, as a big pool, pool of water and then you reform somewhere else. Just, not just useful but cool, intensely cool, lots of spells here. And then we have your friendly uh, neighborhood assassin next door. The assassin, she is nimble, agile, and particularly deadly. She has a free attack, which is based off of her shuriken, which is particularly, well, thematic, as you can imagine. And then she will choose the affiliation of her clan that will give her different abilities. So every character, each character can be customized right there from the beginning. Let me show you the card of the assassin. Can be customized right there from the beginning. Has a lot of different abilities. By the way, speaking of the assassin, also she's particularly deadly. That is her combat, ignore any armor that an enemy has and thus plus one if she's the only, uh, if that is the only enemy adjacent to her. So pretty much snakes behind him, or in any case, in a place where the enemy can't see, and that makes her particularly deadly, and etc, etc, just unique abilities. Each character is interesting to play, plays very differently, and has a lot of thematic flavor. Terrain tiles, extremely important to establish the atmosphere of the game. You have the usual large, sturdy, beautiful, thematic uh, terrain tiles that you came to expect from Shadows 
of brimstone, but you have some especially unusually large tiles. These two had to be the largest tiles that I've seen in Shadow, unless I'm mistaken. And also they are tactically interesting because they have these barriers, these light, these white lines here, which are impassable physically, but, uh, in, but do not block line of sight. And if you look, yeah, they do, they do represent say, a staircase, they move around here, so you can kind of play here. Maybe you can shoot elemental blasts or shurikens at Dioni as Dioni is pom 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 is scarily climbing uh, the ladder. You can try to defend the bridge and take your stand on the side of the bridge. It's very interesting, it's very neat to me that they add the, the, these details here. But in general, very nice, very thematic tiles and just so large, which even when they don't have barriers, makes them thematically and tactically interesting. On the other side, uh, you have the representation of the other world, which in this case is, brace yourself, the belly of the beast. When they travel to, through a gate to another world, uh, when they use these tiles, they travel to the inside. Yes, boy, you're working, traveling inside the guts of this strange, mysterious, shapeless beast. Maybe you're right there in the belly of Azathoth, or Cthulhu, or you don't know what. What? But so it's a little bit on the gory side, a little bit on the explicitly on the horror side, not just the psychological horror side that you expect from Lovecraft, but more like, well, they just look horrific. Especially if you know what they are. Like, oh look at this, it's just a green oh no, yuck. So uh different flavor, different taste here from previous sets, but definitely eh, if you are in the in the mood for a horror experience, well, you can't get any more horror than entering the bowels of a gigantic monster, right? Gameplay, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it because most of you are familiar with the system and in a nutshell, it is exactly the same system. Different tiles, uh, enemies, abilities and skills, but gameplay is the one that you know from previous sets. So, if you were familiar with that, you can just skip. Uh, this segment. Otherwise, for a quick introduction, the game is scenario based, you will choose a scenario uh, to play. Some scenarios will start with the tiles on the board, with the map fully known. In other scenarios, you start from the entrance and you explore. You move a number of spaces. In the standard game, you roll a die. I personally don't like random rolls for movement, so I use the optional rule that says that each hero will move by four uh, spaces each turn, plus minus modifiers. However, if you if you roll for movement and you roll a one, and if you don't roll for movement, you should, you should still roll the die to see if you roll a one, because on a one you get a grit token, very important resource that will allow you to roll dice or to get extra movement. So you alternate moving and doing other things such as scavenging that is looking for possible treasures uh, in the present tile. When you reach an edge and you keep exploring, other well the, the tile is already here because that is what the setup told you to do to place a tile there or you randomly draw a card from the map deck and it tells you which room to f you find and also uh, where you're entering. Here for, here, for example, we have this ginormous, this ginormous style, we enter it from there, that is the sacred garden. You can see, you can play thematically, that is, there will be an encounter there that is determined, or you draw a random encounter, if indeed an encounter will occur. You will have exploration tokens, a stack of exploration tokens, when you find a new place, you place an exploration token there and that will tell you if you're attacked and it's an ambush or if it's a regular attack or you find encounters or you resolve whatever it is. If it's an encounter, you will draw a card, resolve, there are tests to take based on the skills and abilities of the characters with different types of effects that will occur. If you're fighting against a monster, uh, if you are supposed to fight, you'll draw a card from a threat deck. The level, low, medium, hard of epic depends on the scenario, on the difficulty you've chosen, how many heroes you have. In any case, the threat deck will tell you how many and which type of enemies you encounter. 
we will set them on the board and then uh, you will uh, activate heroes and monsters in order of initiative and suppose that I know we have we're in the heart of the action and this tango is here and this tango is there and the other and the sorceress is dealing with your Yonago Aryonago. Anyways, what happens during combat is, well, when a hero or an enemy activates, uh, they can fight. To fight, you roll a number of dice equal to the character's combat. Do you inflict a hit? And the number to hit depends on whether you're attacking in range or melee. For each hit that you that you produce, then you roll a die to determine the damage that you produce on the opponent. You reduce that by the defense of the opponent, apply the remaining damage, and you hope that the opponent went down to zero health points. When the opponent's attack is pretty much the same idea. They also roll dice, uh, and the number is based on their combat ability. They also determine how many hits they roll based on their number to hit, but their hits um, they don't necessarily translate immediately in damage. In fact, the heroes have an extra step, which is the defense, the defense step. And so you roll, for each hit, you roll a die, and if you roll your defense or higher, you annul that hit. Each hit that is not annulled results usually in a point of damage. Very simple, very short introduction, very incomplete introduction with sh to Shadow of Brimstones. But if you have never heard about the game before, I don't know, that's, that will have to suffice for the time being, I guess. There's also an older video of mine in which I talk about Shadows of Brimstone and its gameplay in more detail. I love the Shadows of Brimstone system. So you may think of me as a biased, as a biased uh, reviewer. Actually, maybe I was an opinionated because it's not like there's bias. I never tried the game before. I tried it. I loved it. So I had very high expectations, and those expectations have been met and possibly exceeded. This is a really great set. I'm incredibly happy that I have it in my collection. I had a blast and a half. Playing it, I played it with friends, I played it solo because that's another great thing of the system. And I rediscovered all of the things that I always liked about Shadows of Brainstone the thematic explosion, the thematic depth. You are there, it just feels so immersive. You're there in the world of the story, really seeing this fascinating setting from the point of view of the characters, which is something that you, when you can do entirely through the affordances of board gaming and not conventional role-playing gaming, that is quite, it is quite amazing that you can achieve that through discrete rules, die rolls, tables, cards, without a human narrator there. The components and the rules simply coalesce together with the actions of the players in giving you this absolutely immersive experience. And to me, that is just so fun because I love games that tell stories. I love Lovecraftian stories. So a board game that tells me Lovecraftian stories even better. On top of that, I play so many Lovecraftian games that uh, Hasn't happened yet, but I always worried, oh my gosh, am I going to get bored by them? Turns out, of course, there can be a lot of variety, because if these themes are eternal, why not have them in the age of piracy? Why not have them in ancient Rome? Why not have them, say, in, in fantasy versions of, of traditional Japan? So, uh, I really like the variety that this set brings, while at the same time still being so quintessentially shadows both because of the mechanics that are the same, but still the atmosphere, the flavor. I don't really see, I, I, I don't see, really see any problem porting characters from other parts of the Shadows of Prince of Universe here. I think it would just be integrated seamlessly. If anything else, the crazier the situation is, the more thematically appropriate it is, because again, Lovecraftian horror is all about accepting the fact that the universe has not been created to you for you, has has no obligation to make you feel good about yourself, has no obligation to make sense to you. It's you. Uh, it's about you accepting the madness of the universe. And here again, banditos and samurais. Uh, can go together, it makes perfect nonsense, which makes sense in Lovecraftian themes. Gameplay. Gameplay is the one that you know and love, and it is just fun as before. Um, I've heard people complaining sometimes that uh, they feel that some of the battles are too long, they take too long, they're too repetitive. I never had that problem with Shadow, so I can't entirely relate. What I can explain is why I don't have that problem. 
First, because it's not all about combat, because you have encounters, you have other things that happen, the missions have different objectives, different flavor. Uh, when the fights start, you have, will have different enemies, different combinations of enemies, and there really is a tactical depth depth in which you can choose different things to do, different moves, different maneuvers, different weapons, different upgrades to use. All the four characters here actually seem really to have been designed to bring that extra level of detail, variety to combat. So I'm, I'm wondering if you did have a problem with the combat in Shadow, if you felt it was too um, repetitive at the beginning, uh, maybe give this one a try because between the different tactics that the samurai gets to use and the different moves, uh, different upgrades that the monk can have and can choose when to use the magic bell or when to use chi one way or the other the maneuvers of the assassin the spells of the sorceress and to me that's the most fun character to play but but the other ones are pretty fun too there's a degree of customization and there is a degree of tactical flexibility and variety that i think I think will please most people that love thematic games, that like combat games, and may even convert some people that maybe like the original idea, but maybe they thought they felt that combat was a little too linear and dry. I didn't have this problem here at all. The game seems to be very well balanced. So many times, really, uh, the scenario comes down to a final climatic moment, a climatic moment of the time that you have in fiction in which the heroes almost defeated the villain, but also almost dead. It really, everything seems to be hanging in the balance. And that happens a little too often when I play Shadows for that to be, uh, to be, to be by chance to me. It really feels like the game has been tweaked and balanced and designed well precisely to present a healthy, hard, not impossible challenge, which from the point of view of gameplay works, and one that also from the narrative point of view really creates a narrative arc from a situation that is not too bad to this epic climatic scene in which everything will be resolved in one heroic actions. Shadows of Brainstorm remains to me a great narrative engine in the form of a board game and one that has uh, a no small degree of, of power and, and, and evocative power in the depth and width of its narrative universe. Now we have an entire new chapter, an entire new continent of ideas or experimentations or variations that, uh, that opens up. So I hope we're gonna have more about Japan, maybe then we move to China, maybe we go, maybe go down to uh, Southeastern or Southwestern uh, Asia. Uh, let's have a Shadows of Brimstone world tour because this game is fun enough mechanically that it can support, I don't know, to me, endless, endless var variations. And well, there's, there are a lot of variations that I hope are gonna be applied to the system. I don't know that there are many games that excite me as much as Shadows of Brainstorm because really each game is an adventure, is a story, is an exciting, is a very exciting ride. So highly recommend it to players that are longtime fans of the system and players that have never played it. Give it a try. Give it a try. It's just there's so much fun, so much story, so much adventure, so much excitement that. I don't even know how to explain it, how to convey to you. I hope that my excitement and even my difficulty to communicate how awesome it is will actually paradoxically give you a sense of how much I love Shadow Brainstorm Forbidden Fortress and maybe they'll give you a sense of how much you may love it too because chances are that you will. Such a great game.